Right. Um, so I will go into a demonstration session. Um, I'll go through costing nature first, um, and I'll explain in a minute what these what these tools are. Um, probably about half an hour. Then uh, a water world um, um, simulation or or demonstration, and and then I want to do a scenario analysis, which you can do in in both of these tools. But I'll focus on the hydrological world model called water world. And then if there's any time left, um, we'll do some questions. Um, during the session, there uh, will also be opportunity for for questions. Um, so going through, if at any point you have a question, just put please put them in the text box um, or in the chat box. Sorry, and um, I will address them um, at certain intervals. For instance, when we start running the model, then um, we'll have a little bit of time to take some questions. Right. So, first, a brief introduction. Um, <clears throat> So I want to say a little bit about um, where we're coming from uh, in developing these tools. Um, so costing nature, water worlds, and, and the other model I'm going to briefly talk about is Ecoactory, are um, all part of what we call the policy uh, support systems. And the idea behind those is that we wanted to make science accessible. Um, obviously, there's a lot of models out there that can be used. There's a lot of data out there that can be used. Um, but it, for people, and particularly people with, you know, fewer skills in terms of spatial analysis or GIS, it's very hard to use those tools. Um, and so we wanted to provide a full system that allows you to access data, um, that allows you to use models to process that data um, with, very low, with very low capacity requirements. So um, you can do a training, maybe... Uh, as I'm doing now, a demonstration or a couple of hours training on the on this. Uh, there's no software download, so there's no demands from your local hardware, um, and um, it also and and the, also the, the the idea of these systems is that they allow for the analysis of scenario interventions. Um, so as I said before, these models um, are web-based, so they work from a geo browser that works with models that are on our servers. Um, that um, work with data that is on our service. And so there's no need for a user to download anything really. Um, and these are all available through um, this web link here, policy support.org. So that's sort of the background of where this is coming from. Um, so all of the tools have common characteristics. Uh, they're all spatial. Um, they act from local to global scales. Um, on different resolutions. So the, the smallest resolution is one hectare um, and globally we can run them at 10 kilometers. Um, but country basin wide analysis, you would use it at one kilometer scale resolution. Um, as I said, they come with all the required data that you need to run uh, the model. Um, but if you do have better data, then you can use that data. Um, and we continuously strive to get the best data in these systems and we've harmonized that from a lot of sources. Um, but I'll say a little bit more about data later on when we go through the, the demonstration. Um, the models, well particularly Waterworld, is process based so it's not just a really simple model, they're actually process based so they're, they're running simulations on each grid cell um, but because they run on servers um, they are pretty fast so you can do a full analysis in about half an hour um, they're simple to use um, and we deliver them with scenario intervention tools uh, also tools to look at things like uncertainty to validate data so you can run it with different input data sets and see what the differences are between those um, and you can download the results as well if you want to use them in your own gis um, and they are free to use, um, but that's only for certain levels. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about those um, uh, levels later as well. So all of them have this um, common web interface that allows you to visualize. Uh, and so this is what I mean with, you don't really need GIS capacity to do something that is very similar to GIS, but just through a web browser. Um, so you can look at maps obviously, but you can also do um, you can create scatter graphs, you can do histograms of the data, you can do uh, map animations, you look at time series, uh, we can do um, statistics, we can do zonal stats, uh, we can aggregate these maps by other maps, etc. So there's a lot of things that you can do in these systems without having to download any of the data behind it. 
Um, so the first model that I want to talk about then is costing nature. Uh, so this is a, a ecosystem services model. Uh, and it maps ecosystem services again at, at local basin or national scales. Um, and unlike some of the other models out there, it uh, distinguishes between potential services, so services that are produced but not consumed, and realized services, as we call it. Um, so services that are produced but also uh, consumed by beneficiaries. <laughs> And so that's quite important to uh, distinguish to, between those two, because often these, those are not in the same place. So as we heard this morning, obviously ecosystem services, a lot of them flow from the area of production downstream to where the beneficiaries are. Uh, for instance, a hydropower dam that is downstream of a, an upstream, upstream forest that provides the uh, continuous flow of water to it. And so to separate these might lead to the prioritization of different, uh, different areas. Um, it values ecosystem services in relative terms. So every map you get out of the system will give you a score between zero and one, um, almost all of them. Um, but you can also now value some of these economically. I will say a little bit more about that in the next, next slide as well. Um, in addition to ecosystem services, this tool also maps pressures. So things that are currently happening, so agricultural intensities, for instance, uh, mines, uh, roads, all those sorts of things that put a pressure on in terms of a, a conservation priority. And threats, which we um, sort of um, define as anything that could be a future threat. So these are things like agricultural suitabilities. Um, as I said before, there are uncertain validation tools and we can also run this on the scenario conditions. So costing nature um, at the moment uh, has 13 different uh, ecosystem services included. Um, so they're listed here. So we have uh, timber, uh, both commercial and non-commercial, uh, fuel wood, grazing and grazing fodder production, uh, water provisioning, non-root forest products, fish catch, carbon, natural hazard mitigation, which is focusing on floods, droughts, landslides, and coastal inundation, culture-based tourism, nature-based tourism, environmental and aesthetic quality services, wildlife services, wildlife disservices. So that gives you a negative um, value. Biodiversity and pressure and threat are obviously not necessarily uh, included as an ecosystem service here. Um, now I should really sort of highlight that um, this tool and Waterworlds as well are relatively high level tools. They use global data sets, they are globally applicable, um, they're spatial and you can run them at scales from national to basin. And so um, they wouldn't provide you with very, very detailed answers in terms of ecosystem services for particularly for small areas. Um, and I think that is true for most models, um, particularly spatial models, that, that data just does not exist to do these things um, at very high resolutions of a very small areas. And so I think these, these tools should really be seen as scoping tools that can be very useful um, for larger, larger areas. Uh, and I hope some of that becomes a bit more clear when we go through the actual demonstration. Um, and also I should say that obviously these are just a couple of tools that we use a lot with. Um, I'm heavily involved in um, also in terms of uh, producing these tools, um, but they're not the only tools out there, of course. Uh, Steve already mentioned ARIES, which is another ecosystem services mapping tool in his session this morning. Uh, INVEST is another well-known tool. And there's a couple of others out there. And so this is not to say, you know, these are the tools that should be used. It's not an endorsement specifically for these tools. It's just one of the tools in, in, in a wider tool set. And we always um, encourage people to look at other tools out there as well. They might be doing different things or look at different things. So this is just to briefly highlight um, that it, costing nature can do an economic valuation as well. And uh, this is still a relatively new component to the model. Um, and this does require quite a bit of user input because what is needed for all of these variables on the left here, you would have to um, put economic values in, use values and non-use values. Um, 
And so this is only needed if you are undertaking economic valuation. Um, this has been done so far for only a few places um, and would require uh, quite a lot of data on economic value. But it's just to say that it is uh, uh, possible to do that with this model as well. So then just an, a little example here. Um, so the kind of analyses that you could be doing with Posture Nature is this sort of prioritization analysis. Um, so in this case, um, looking at uh, ecosystem services, realized ecosystem services on the left um, and biodiversity on the right. Um, and obviously there is this um, notion of uh, 30 by 30 as one of the um, proposals going forward in, in uh, uh, conservation. Um, and this is a kind of tool that you could use to see what that would look like in spatial terms, right? Um, so on the left, I've constraints the top 30% pixels, um, so above 70% for ecosystem services, and on the right I've done the same for biodiversity. And then we can clearly see on the scale of the whole of Tanzania that there are clear spatial trade-offs. So the realized ecosystem services, uh, not surprisingly, is not exactly in the same place as where we see really high biodiversity values. Uh, so this comes back to that, um, what I mentioned earlier about um, uh, potential services versus realized services because obviously realized services tend to be higher in areas where there are uh, people to consume them. That's why the realized services light up in areas around Dar es Salaam and, and other big cities. Um, so this is the kind of analysis that you can do really quickly um, in a tool like um, Cost in Nature. Right, so that was a um, very, very brief introduction to costing nature. Um, and I'll move on to the other tool um, that we're going to be talking about today, which is Waterworld. Um, so Waterworld is a, a more complex tool. It's a, it's a hydrological model, a fully distributed process-based hydrological model. And so it can be used to assess the supply and demand for water quality, quantity, regulation, erosion, and sedimentation. Um, and it's uh, also become very useful to look at things like natural flood management. Um, I can say a little bit more about that when we go through the actual demonstration. This tool also includes scenario tools um, to assess the impact of, for instance, climate change and land use change on the water-related services. It also includes a land use change model called Quick Look. And what this tool does, it looks at where is recent deforestation um, and then it can project forward that recent um, deforestation based on um, uh, demand, spatial allocation. Um, uh, so things, for instance, like accessibility, roads, etc. cetera. Um, and that's a quite useful tool because, you know, you can just look at what is the, the deforestation rate over, say, the last 10 years um, and then project forward, see what it would look like in 2030 or 2050 if we carry on like this on the business as usual. Um, and you can also speed it up or slow it down by setting a factor on that. Um, and finally, this tool also includes other policy options and intervention tools. So we can look at, and there's a couple of examples here, riparian buffer strips, uh, eco-efficiency, um, sanitation, water treatment, mining. There's some other options to look at population changes as well. Um, and so one of the outputs, uh, I think is on this, Next slide as well is, is this map on the right here, which is a map of um, a wetland area uh, and looking at how far does the downstream influence go of this particular um, uh, wetland. And so it maps how far downstream um, uh, anything coming out of this wetland would go, which is, is quite useful to look at the influence areas. So the user interface for Waterworld looks like this, which is very similar to what it would look like for costs in nature. Um, we have uh, a map in the center, and then on the left, um, we have uh, our, our, our uh, links to interacting with, with the tools. Um, and there's only a couple steps required. Um, set up your um, area, prepare your data, run a simulation, and then you can look at results and start doing uh, scenarios on top of that. 
Here's a little overview of the kind of scenario options that are available in water world. So climate change, land use cover change, land and water management. You can also, as I said before, replace some of the input maps. So if you have better data available for your area of interest, you can upload that. It does require some GIS skills to prepare that data. Um, and you can look at extractive population. And this little um, clip here is um, what the outputs look like. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later during the demo. So these are some more example outputs. It's again focusing on Tanzania. So on the left here, we look at uh, baseline water balance. So this is one kilometer resolution, looking at the pixel-based um, water balance calculated by Waterworld. Um, and then some of the methods of aggregating the output. So this is averaging over administrative boundaries. This bottom one is averaging over sub-basins. Um, and this uh, table here is um, the statistics for this particular map. So it gives you all the stats, the, the, the minimum, the maximum, standard deviation, um, coefficient of variation, all of that. Um, and all of this at the click of a button. So it's, it's really quick and easy to do. On the right uh, is an example of the uh, output in terms of the runoff. So this is the total annual runoff cubic meters for an area of Tanzania as well. Um, and obviously this is focusing on the river system that we have in there. So um, that's just very briefly overview of those two tools. Um, and then a sort of word of, of caution, I guess, um, as with any sort of model and tool, um, there are times where these tools are very suitable uh, in other situations they might be less suitable. So we've tried to give a brief overview of that. So these tools are very useful when you don't have a uh, baseline um, or a very poor one where you don't have a lot of data um, or capacity to assess ecosystem services, where you need something that is relatively quick, um, cheap, um, but still detailed enough for uh, management policy relevant scales and where you need to look at a projection of change factors. So if you're interested in, you know, what will happen on the climate change, what will happen if we convert this area to agriculture, what will happen to our hydrology in this particular area, um, without the need for running very complicated hydrological models, then these tools are, are very useful. Um, you should not use these tools when you need to predict uh, future magnitudes. So if you're looking at particular flow or sediment volumes at a particular dam, and it needs to be very uh, precise. Um, water world is a water resources model. So it, it doesn't run through time series of flow and it doesn't calibrate. This is the next point on here. We don't calibrate the model, um, which would also be too complicated. Um, for uh, you know, uh, someone with, without those skills, or when you have a very small site, because this, this, the smallest resolution on the models is one hectare. Um, and so it'd be, it wouldn't make much sense to just look at a few pixels. Um, but for any other situation, um, very uh, easy to use. So we have a lot of users, um, as you can see here, about three and a half thousand organizations have used it or are using it in a, a lot of countries. Um, and on the right, you can see some of the um, intensity of use uh, in the word clouds, uh, in terms of organizations, in terms of the questions that people would like to ask from these, these systems. So finally, I want to very briefly uh, introduce another tool that is uh, very new, only developed over the last year or so, which is called EcoActuary. Um, and this is a somewhat more complicated tool, and I'm not going to demo this one, but it might be useful for some of your work, um, because this is a tool that can be used to look at the risk and risk mitigation by nature-based solutions uh, and through asset adaptation. Um, so it's uh, based on uh, costing nature and water world uses elements from those models, um, but it's focusing much more on particular assets. Um, so this could be any sort of infrastructure or buildings and things like that. 
and it cal calculates uh, flood damages to those. Um, it, uh, Use, it's a probabilistic model, so it simulates a whole range of uh, possible uh, flows going through a system, and you can do that under climate change conditions as well. And then you can look at the, the damage curves coming out of that. So it's, it's a slightly more complicated model, but it could be very uh, useful, particularly if you're interested in um, nature-based mitigation and, and asset adaptation. So if you want to know anything more about that model, then you can look at this web link here or uh, ask me some questions later on. Right, so I think that um, concludes the um, introduction. So, um, we start from this uh, policy support or website. So um, this is the, the main web page. Um, and at the top here, you see the different tools that we have. So we have Waterworld. Aquanus Compounds, Costing Nature, Menara. There's a couple of other ones um, that I'm not talking about today. Um, but on this main page as well are a set of training videos. So after this session, if you're really interested in, for instance, starting to get, uh, trying to get started on this model or these models, you can go to this web page and see the self-paced training videos. They're all YouTube videos that go step-by-step -step through how to apply uh, these models with, with examples. Um, and on those, the training page, there's a lot of uh, information as well on case studies, et cetera, that you can learn from. Um, but we're gonna go to Costing Nature first. I'm going to click on Costing Nature. I'm gonna log in as what we call a mega user, which is one of the, the licensed um, uh, user interfaces. And all that means is that it has a few more outputs that I can show you. So we have, um, there's a whole page here on uh, the different license level, but the what we call scientist user level is always free. It will always be free, um, and is a great is a great start. It just gives you a few a couple of fewer options, uh, and because I want to sh to show you the full functionality of these models, so, um, I'm going to log in as mega user. I will do that first. So this is the. Um, User interface, same as what I showed on the slide before for Waterworld. Um, but as I said, you could get the same user interface for all the models. Um, so the center of the page is this, this map that you can zoom in and out of. And you'll notice quickly that when I zoom out, you don't see anything. But when you zoom in, you see those blue tiles appear. Um, and these are ten, um, uh, uh, roughly um, 10 by 10 degree tiles, I should say. Um, and they will run the model at one kilometer resolution. Uh, if I zoom in more, you see pink tiles appear and pink tiles highlighted, and they would run the model at one hectare resolution. So therefore the sort of more local um, uh, cases. Um, and then at the top, you see the drop down here, you can select between one hectare, one kilometer. So that would just run this, this tile or you can select a basin or a country, which is what we're gonna do in this, uh, in this demo. On the left here, you see the control panel. Um, so this is the various steps um, that I, I highlighted earlier. So we're gonna go through that in the demo. Um, and so we're gonna st start setting up a run for Tanzania. So I'm gonna use the drop down to select the country of Tanzania. And I'm going to call that country Tanzania. You always need to make sure you put a name in this box. Um, and then I'm going to click on step one, which is to define the area. And this will now have set the run, as we call it, to Tanzania, which you can see at the top here, Tanzania. And if I click on there, you get a bit of an overview where this is. Um, and also it will tell you if it's been run. So there's no date here yet, so it hasn't been run before. Close that. So now that we've defined the run, um, we need to look at the setup data for it. So I'm going to click on step two, pair data. And that opens up a new page uh, with a couple of options. Um, list baseline workspace data. There's no point in clicking on this at the moment because I haven't copied over the data yet. Um, there's also a link on use alternative input maps. Simterra is the database behind this model and all the models. Um, and that allows me to replace some of the input data that is in there already with versions that we have in our data set. So for instance, for land use, 
there's a couple of options. Um, there will be a couple of other maps as well that we can replace with older versions, for instance. Um, but by default, the model will always use the latest data sets available. So all we need to do in this step is to copy data directly to your workspace. That opens up a new window. Um, and what this, this model is doing now is it's pulling the data from the server, uh, the Sintera data server behind it, and copies that data over into your own workspace. So that is your dedicated user space on the servers. Um, and if we hover the mouse over these little green bars here, you can see what it's doing. So it's unzipping data. Um, for different, so there's uh, 108 maps in total that it needs to unzip. So this usually takes one or two minutes. Um, but as with all interactions with, uh, with these models, um, nothing is done on your local computer. So as soon as you click on it, it will, it will set that action in motion. Um, and even if you lose connection, if you then uh, regain your connection, the model will have just carried on doing what it needs to do. So there's a couple of steps in getting um, the data correct. Consistency between maps, that is in case you have changed some of the input maps, for instance. Uh, and so to come back to Jago's earlier question, you can replace all the data, but to do so, you will have to run a baseline first uh, with the data that is in there. So you have to copy over all the data to your workspace first before you can attempt to try and change that data. It should be nearly finished now. Formatting. Maps that it needs to reformat, but um, this, because this, done, this run has been done before, it should be relatively quick. It doesn't have to go for all 1444. So whilst it's doing that, uh, we can also have a look at some of the other options here. So we've cloud clicked on step two, prepare data. Um, but there is also uh, the help documentation here. So we have the system documentation and the model documentation links here. So if you want to know about uh, more about the underlying assumptions, data sets, etc., cetera, um, that's uh, underpinning the model, then you would click on the model documentation. Um, and these are uh, Google Docs as well. So here you have all the uh, documentation uh, for all the individual models um, uh, in Costa Nature version three, because that's the model that we're running. Now let's see where we are, still doing that. And let's click on the system documentation as well. So this is a user guide, uh, which also has the individual steps highlighted. Um, and these would all link to the documentation in terms of the videos, etc. So there's video demonstration, quick start, etc. here is available as well. Right. So just going back to that um, page that was copying over the data to our workspace that has now finished. Um, and so we can now have a look at the uh, data that we have. So if we look at show workspace data, there's these plus minuses next to it, so I'll click on those. And that opens up this table um, with all the data sets in there. And when there, whenever there's a green icon like this, it means we can have a look at that data. Um, some of the data sets you can download, some others you can't, um, because we have permission to use that data, but not to redistribute it. And so that's, that's another um, feature of these, these models. Um, what I said in the introduction is that this is all about making data available and models available. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean giving you all the data. It, it just means that we allow you to use that data because we have uh, license agreements with data providers. Um, we can put them in the system. The model can run on those data sets, but we don't have to give you those data sets. So it's, uh, it's a good way of being able 
to um, use all the best data available. Um, but as you can see, some of the data you can download. Um, and so again, coming back to Jager's question about how to use your own data, if you want to do that, I would set it up like this and then download this study area map, which is basically a binary mask, zero to one uh, values of the study area. And that gives you the perfect extent and resolution of the data that we need for uploading. As I say, all these green icons are data sets that we can look at. Um, so just uh, for example, let's have a look at the um, land cover data that we have in there. So we can look at the um, tree cover ground um, data. So I'll click on the green icon here. And that gives us a map of fractional tree cover. So this is based on Copernicus land cover data for 2015. And so this is the percentage of tree cover in each pixel. Um, now the reason we use these fractional data sets and not categorical land cover data sets is because at a relatively coarse resolution of one kilometer, it allows you to have some sub-pixel heterogeneity that you don't have if you would have a categorical land cover data set. And that is particularly relevant for, for water worlds, which is the hydrological model, is that you, know, you don't just classify a whole one kilometer square as uh, forest or agriculture, you can have a much more fine-tuned way of classifying that, that pixel. So this is the typical output you get, um, or I should say uh, web viewer you get for looking at output maps. And there's a whole range of things we can do here. Um, so obviously this is this is the map and all your output data will be uh, served in this this format as well underneath it is a range of options we can download a kml file so we can overlay this on google earth um, we can get a histogram we can pop out this map so uh, i can open another map and then compare the two because if i open another map then it will overwrite this particular map in this window um, but the viewer that I use most is the uh, Google Maps viewer. So if I click on the Google Maps viewer, we get yet another window. And now we can see this map in the context of um, the background. Um, so I can toggle the map on and off, um, set the opacity of this map, but I can also interrogate the map. So I can ha zoom into any area I like, see this, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little, red crosshair here i can overlay that on an area click on query and it gives me the particular point value so any one of you that have used the gis you will know that this is a very similar function you can do in the gis as well you can just get a point value um, but you can also click on inputs and then you get another icon here that allow you to get the values for all the underlying maps available. Now in this case, there's no point to do that because it's just an input map. But if we have an output map, we can look at all the underlying um, data that was used to create this map. Um, there's something else in this, this thing you can do. So if I zoom out, I can create uh, what's called a permalink. So if I click on this little icon here, this photo, icon then at the top you get a new icon which is a link and if i click on that i get this what's called permalink um, and that link will stay uh, available even after you close the model even after your models are automatically deleted your model runs because the system only holds them for 72 hours um, these will stay available. And so this is a great way of sharing your uh, results with other people in your project. Um, you create a permalink, send it to them, and they, they can open this link and get this page, and they can zoom in and out and look at that map. Um, so closing that, um, we'll be looking at that later anyway. Underneath the map, there are a couple of other options. We can change the image, so we can set the scales. We can look at positives only, look at negatives only. We can look at statistics. Um, we can uh, mask by other maps. Um, so if I click that, I get a drop down, and 
there is a whole range of other maps in there that I can use to aggregate these values over, right? So if I want to look at what is the um, tree cover um, percentage in um, protected areas, I can click on protected areas and then the pop-up map will show me where protected areas are. So all protected areas have a value of one. So I can say equals one and then run that analysis. And in this case, something went wrong because it didn't show me where the, what the value is in protected areas. Um, but I can assure you that is a function that works. Um, but we'll next time try it for another map. Um, uh, yeah, there's a couple of other things here, um, but I think I'll get to those once we've run the model. Um, so I'm going to close that now. So we have done step two, prepared our data. Then the next step to run this model is to run the actual simulation. And click on step three. Um, and there's only one thing you need to choose here is whether you want to um, index the values within the analysis area. So in this case, the whole country of Tanzania or whether you want to do it globally. Now, the reason for having this option is if you have a study area that crosses two different basins or two different countries or two different tiles, um, then you will be, want to be able to compare them and stick them together in a GIS. So in that case, you can uh, index them globally. And what it will then do is then for each of those ecosystem services, it will, um, it will normalize it between zero and one based on the highest value found globally and not within the study area. Now, in this case, we're only interested in results for Tanzania. So I'm gonna set it to, leave it to the default is to index local. So that's all we need to do here um, and then click start. And that should um, start the analysis. Um, and then hopefully this will run relatively quickly. Costing nature is usually very quick. Um, but it also depends on how busy the server is. So it will tell you what it's doing. So it's currently preparing variables. Calculating downstream sums, that's important for looking at beneficiaries and things. So I'll show you how to do that. So now it's, it's finalized. Um, so we can close that page um, and then we can go to step five, which is results maps. So I'll open this up. Um, and this will again open a new page um, with all the outputs um, for all the ecosystem services and some other maps as well. So starting at the bottom, we have a map of potential clean water provision. That's the only one that is in biophysical units. Um, there is uh, environmental aesthetic quality, uh, wildlife, uh, disk services, uh, fisheries, hardwood, softwood timber services, uh, non-wood forest products, uh, grazing and fodder services, nature-based tourism services. Um, so let's have a look at um, one of them or a couple. So this is the natural hazard mitigation index. So I can click on that one. And so this is the contribution of natural areas to mitigate uh, natural hazards indexed between zero and, and one. Um, and so to come back to the question of, can we download those? There's a download button here. So if I click on that, you can see, you can download it as ASCIIs, uh, GeoTIFF, uh, Idrissi, always there's a couple of formats. Um, I usually use ARC ASCIIs. Um, that can be imported straight away into your GIS. So the, the download will be a zip file. Uh, so we'll download it as a, as a zip with some metadata attached to it with the name of your run, uh, when it was done, etc. And citation information as well, because all of these maps have a citation uh, underneath as well, if you want to use that in, say, a publication or anything like that. So uh, again, we can click on show um, in, in um, Google uh, Maps, uh, and we see some areas where we have hardly any or zero uh, natural hazard mitigation, some areas where it is relatively high. Those tend to be 
usually forested areas um, on, along the coast could be mangroves as well, for instance. Zanzibar comes out as quite high in, in natural hazard mitigation. Uh, and this one is actually quite complicated. There's, there's quite a lot of um, data involved in creating this. So it's a function of the actual risk of those hazards based on historical data and occurrences of natural hazards combined with um, the uh, natural ecosystems that can help to mitigate against those. Uh, so uh, again, I would refer to this documentation here if you want to know more about how that map was produced. Um, so it's just an example of one of the outputs. Um, let, let's look at some of the other ones. Um, so I want to look at the total bundled services. So we have, so this combines all services, um, all of those 13, and then re-indexes them between zero and one. Um, so we have the uh, potential bundled services and realized bundled services, and we can compare those. So I'll click on the realized ones first. See what that looks like. And then I use this pop out button here. That will then allow me to close this window and look at the potential one and look at them side by side. Right, so on the left is the potential ecosystem services and on the right it includes beneficiaries. Um, and so the beneficiaries included in costing nature are people, obviously, um, uh, agriculture as a recipient of irrigation water, um, hydropower dams uh, downstream of um, uh, along rivers, uh, obviously uh, beneficiaries of um, uh, upstream uh, watersheds. Uh, and so, as I said before, you, you will often see um, a, a difference in those two maps uh, based on the ones that the ecosystem services that flow. So these are all the place-based ones. Uh, they tend to be high in protected areas and densely forested areas, whereas the realized ones pop up in areas that uh, uh, will be low usually or lower in those areas, those that are red here, uh, and much higher in areas where there's lots of beneficiaries. Um, and so it's an interesting way to look at um, sort of you know, spatial prioritization question. Um, but obviously, these services wouldn't be realized at those locations if they weren't produced at these locations to begin with. Um, and so these maps are both, both important. Um, but in the actual true concept of ecosystem services, we have to include beneficiaries, right? And so for mapping them, we have to include those as well. Um, so I want to just say something a little bit about, before we move on, uh, some of the other maps that it produced here. So we have the biodiversity map as well. So this is uh, richness and endemism um, for uh, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds. So this is based on IUCN data. Uh, so hopefully this is somewhat familiar to people where high biodiversity areas are in Tanzania. Um, and then we have these pressure and threat indices. So future threats, according to accessibility, how far away people are from areas, uh, proximity to recent deforestation, projected change in population and GDP, projected climate change, and distribution of nighttime lights. So that's areas that are currently maybe intact, but could be uh, threatened in future. Um, and then pressure index is where the current pressures are. So this is where are the population densities highest, uh, wildfire frequency, grazing intensity, agricultural intensity, um, infrastructure, dams, mines, oil, gas, urban uh, is included there as well. Um, and then moving up in some of the outputs, um, there's one that is the Delphic Conservation Priority Index, which is also quite interesting because it's just an overlay of conservation priorities um, that have been done over the years by various organizations. So it includes 
uh, EVAs, uh, the eco regions, the hotspots, the last of the wild, um, IBAs, KBAs, all of those. And that's just an, a map that just really quickly would tell you where do um, the various conservation organizations think should be protected or prioritized. So anywhere that's red in this map is where is incredibly important according to um, those conservation priorities identified by other organizations. Um, but the map that I want to get to is the top ones that combine all of them. And so we have what we call the uh, Nature Conservation Priority Index. So this is pressured and threatened conservation priorities where the uh, realized service provision is high. Um, so that's a, a very you know, important priority map. Then you can also look at uh, the, where is the low conservation priority and potential service provision. Um, and that would essentially be the opposite. So you could see these maps as where sh shoots uh, you focus any sort of development, or shoots maybe the wrong word, uh, and where shouldn't you focus any of your development. So these are uh, priority areas in terms of conservation, uh, high in ecosystem service provision, high in biodiversity. Um, and then uh, this one, is low in conservation priority. Um, and that should flip the map and probably focus more on urban areas, etc., uh, maybe agricultural areas. And so these maps are, are very useful in um, um, you know, possibly prioritizing uh, your developments. Um, so I think that's most of it for costing nature. The only thing I haven't done is what I said earlier I would do is to focus on, on Kilombero cluster. Um, and there is the, the best way to do that in costing nature and water worlds is by setting a zone of interest. Um, and you can do that by clicking on this little icon here that opens up a whole page. Um, and there's a, a couple of options here. There's points of interest. So they extract values at points that you're interested in. Zones of interest, they uh, can be used to mask maps and uh, aggregate values over. Um, areas of interest, um, slightly different than zones of interest um, because it's more about the metrics. Um, uh, something also called metrics of interest. It gets a little bit more complicated to explain some of these, um, but there is explanations up above here. So I won't go really into too much detail. And then the final option here is to define a, a, a watershed of points. Um, and what this allows you to do is to select a point on the streamflow network and calculate the upstream area of that point. So for instance, you know that a, uh, a dam is being built on a river um, and you know where that is, then you can define that point on the river system and that pops up in this map. Uh, and so just randomly, uh, you would then zoom in, overlay the crosshair um, and click on define point. You can do that for multiple points. Uh, and once you've done that, um, you give it a name and then it should calculate um, a map of the upstream area of that point that I just clicked. And so this is a, a, a really quick way of uh, finding an upstream watershed uh, just by putting a point on the map and say calculate. Um, but what I wanted to show was how to, uh, see if I have page still open, oh, how to upload a zone of interest map. So, um, I've already created a map called mask um, because, oh, actually I should go back here. There's different ways of doing uh, zones of interest. So you can select ones that have already been uploaded and actually have done that already, or you can use rules. And the rules is similar to what I tried to show before with those protected areas. So you can say, um, I'm only interested in a particular, um, let's see what we're going to choose um, administrative area for instance so i pop up that map 
and there's, as you as you can see, there's a whole range of maps in there. Um, so this is local administrative boundaries. Um, so what I then can do, I can open this in uh, my Google Map Viewer, and I can get the actual value of that point. So say I'm interested in this this admin boundary, I copy that value for that point that I got by putting the crosshair over it and clicking query. Um, and then I say equals this value. Um, you can also do other things um, uh, by excluding areas, for instance. So you could, you could say only select a certain elevation, for instance. Um, and that should give me a map of just that area, right? And so this is the way we can really start targeting sub areas within any basin or any country uh, by the data that's already in there um, or indeed by uploading data as I have done for Quilombero. Um, so the process of doing that is select the map uh, with the right name and then you can upload it through here. Um, and it will quickly upload that map. This is also how you would upload your own maps uh, for other data sets, but not through this page. Um, check and submit, and it will upload that particular um, map. And so this is a map of the Kilombero watersheds. Um, so this is, I think, and Jago can confirm the uh, this is based on a land cover data set for Lombero uh, watershed. So I've now set this as, as my zone of interest. Um, and now if I refresh the page, I should be able to pick any of my output maps. Um, so let's do the overall uh, conservation priority index, high realized service provision. and then mask it by my zone of interest map. And there you go, that pulls out just that particular area. So this is just the values for the Kilombero watershed. And you can do all the other things um, that I've shown before for the whole of Tanzania. You can do it for this particular uh, region now as well. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot more things that you can do with um, output maps. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that. I could possibly quickly show you one more thing is that fairly recently, um, we've um, also developed a SDG uh, component to this model, um, which is nature's contribution to the sustainable development goals. And basically, this uses uh, some sort of matrix um, of um, looking at what ecosystem services contribute to what uh, sustainable development goals. So it gives you a pixel based overview of, um, um, you know, how important that pixel is to what goals uh, and overall contributions to uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, there's a paper that we wrote about this um, and I will include that in the um, post demo uh, communication that Amaya will forward. Right, um, so I'm now gonna uh, close out of um, costing nature because I wanna move on to the other model, water world. Um, so I need to log out of this one, close this and go back to the main page. And now I can select water world. Um, for that one, we're in version two at the moment. Uh, and on this page, by the way, there is presentations on these tools. Um, and all the way at the bottom here, there is a bit more information on the status, documentation, key references, um, and some other information you might want to know about this model. Uh, now I'm just gonna open up the model. And as you can see, it's exactly the same um, uh, login page or um, user interface. Um, 
And this works exactly the same as well, but the model behind it is quite different. It takes a bit longer to, uh, to run. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna set up for Tanzania as well. Um, so scroll down and the benefit for you is that you can see it's done twice. Define area, it's always just step one. And then at the top here, we see it appear. There's also some other information at the top in both models. Um, what version you're in. Uh, sometimes you're in another version um, and you can't access all the runs, for instance, the license, license situation, uh, the disk use, etc. cetera. Um, all possibly relevant if you would start to use this model um, more regularly. So we've done step one, we defined the area. So the next step, same as costing nature, we need to prepare the data. Um, in this case, also we can use alternative maps, um, but for the baseline, I'm going to say copy directly um, to workspace. So, cost, uh, sorry, Waterworld uses a few more maps than costing nature. So, this might take a little bit longer, um, but the process is exactly the same. It's uh, simply a matter of clicking um, and then waiting for the data to uh, be ready. So, this is also, so I've now defined the area prepare the data um, and I'm now ready to go through, have a look at the workspace data. So obviously this is a different model, so it requires different data sets, right? So there's climate data in here, um, things like mean sea level pressure, um, cloud frequencies, it's a, it's a hydrological model. So it needs quite a lot of inputs. Um, but also at the top here is this bit that says redefine land use and cover according to your own map. And that's that tool that I, talked about earlier uh, that allows you to convert categorical data into um, um, the data that is required by these models um, and there is some there's a tutorial on that somewhere in uh, um, the help pages so I'm going to quickly proceed with running the model because the model takes a little bit longer to run I hit start simulation um, here I have an option as well um, which is to write maps or not. So Waterworld uh, uses a temporal time step of a month. So it does 12 months uh, a year, obviously. Um, and it only gives you outputs for one year because it's a water resources model. So it does, it takes an average of climate. Um, but if you would want to have those monthly maps, then you would have to click on write maps. Um, I'm not gonna do that now because I'm just showing you the annual outputs and it's much faster to run it. Um, without writing all those outputs. Uh, so I'm just going to hit start and that should start running the model. Um, and this model takes a little bit longer to run, probably about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so we'll just let that run and see how we go. Uh, and uh, I can always revert to an older run if I want to continue on showing some of the results. Um, there's something else I wanted to say about, yeah, so the time step in Waterworld, uh, it's not monthly, it's actually, uh, it, it runs um, four time steps a day for uh, uh, an average day in, an av in a given month. Um, so it has four diurnal time steps, as we call it, because some processes are obviously different at night from daytime, uh, such as uh, solar radiation and evapotranspiration, of course. Um, and so overall, there are 12 times four is 48 time steps in the model. Um, so what it's doing now, it's copying over um, some of the maps that have already been calculated. Um, and that would include some of the solar radiation data sets. Um, so as I say, this model can be applied anywhere in the world, um, but it doesn't mean that it has been run for anywhere in the world. And so in some cases, um, in very remote areas or one hectare resolution, if the model's never been run before, um, it will have to do those calculations of solar radiation, which can take up to 24 hours. Um, so if that happens to you, you pick an area that's never been run before, uh, you just have to let it run overnight um, and then log back in the next day and, and it will have finalized. Um, so that's one thing to know about that. Um, so same as costing nature, on the left here, we have the 
uh, system documentation and the uh, model documentation. Um, there's also all the versions of the model. Um, so we're currently running version three, uh, sorry, two. Um, version three um, takes a little bit longer to run, um, but does include a um, subsoil component. So it will look at uh, groundwater and base flow uh, things as well. Um, as you can see, the model now says calculating fog. Um, so this model was originally developed um, as a, uh, a model to look at the contribution of cloud forests to the water balance. And so it has a, a quite sophisticated sort of component in there to calculate uh, contribution from cloud forests. Uh, and so this is not um, relevant in all geographies, um, but it can be quite a significant contribution in some tropic, tropical countries to the overall water balance. Um, as with snow dynamics, obviously, in, uh, in, in other places. But that's something else actually I can explain whilst it's running, is that, as I said before, um, these models don't store your data forever. So <laughs> once you've run a model, um, it will only store your simulation for 72 hours. And the reason for that is that all these runs take up a lot of space, right? So every user has space on the server, um, but if you copy over all that data, start to produce lots of outputs, you can easily run into gigabytes of space. And storing space on servers is expensive, and it's a free model. So what we do is we give you access to the results for 72 hours. After that, if you, if you still need access to it, you will have to rerun the model. Um, or you can use those permalinks, as I showed you before, um, to uh, to keep access to some of the output maps. Sorry, I keep doing this and forgetting what I'm doing. So I'll tell you what I'm doing. So on the left here is a button called Manage Simulations. Um, and that allows you to look at what simulations do I have in the system? Uh, so 10 degree, one degree, all types by default. I'll just leave it to default. I click on that and it tells me I'm storing six runs out of a maximum of 10. Um, if you log in as a scientist, I think you're only allowed to have four or five runs. Um, but this is also where you can say delete my older runs. Uh, and if you don't delete them and you're at your maximum, you can't do a new run until you've deleted some of the old data. Um, so I can just scroll through here and this will tell me um, the different runs that I have in the system. So this is the one that it's currently doing. Um, let's see where we are. But it's still taking a while. So I can then select an older run, which you can do now, choose this baseline, uh, close that, and then I make sure to refresh it, which because my other run was called Tons of the Country. Um, and so this one has already been run. And so I can go straight to results. There we go. And so this is what the results look like in Water World. So, so you get a very similar page as Costing Nature, but obviously different outputs. So the, the table that you get first is the main results. If I click on all maps here, it gives me a whole range of other maps. Um, um, that I can download straight away in different formats, uh, or I can, in, you know, look at through um, these, these green buttons. So let's just look at some of the key results. The key result to me for a water model, a spatial water model is the water balance. So let's have a look at the water balance. So this is the baseline water balance. This is the same map that I showed you in the actual presentation at the beginning. Uh, and then I said, you can aggregate by other regions. And so I've explained in costing nature demo, you can do that by masking by this zone of interest or any other mask, but masking will give you the pixel values within that. We can also aggregate and I can do that by clicking on view by. So if I click on view by, again, I get a, a drop down menu of a range of maps. Um, 
there you go, um, that I can use to aggregate this over. So the example I had in uh, the presentation was one of admin boundaries and sub basins. So if I do that, so this is averaging the total water balance over major sub basins based on this data set called hydro sheds, um, which is sometimes a much more um, informative way of showing outputs rather than the pixel based outputs. We can look at, you know, what is that for this total area um, or um, again, protected areas, although this seems to be a minor bug with protected area data sets. Um, but yeah, we can do that for other data sets as well. Let's see one that is. Um, see if this one works. Ramsar sites. Nope. Not many, but it does work. Uh, and so it gives you the average of all those pixels within these boundaries. And you can do all the same things that we've done before by opening up these maps and zooming in and getting the values. Obviously you have the legend here, but if you want to know exactly what is the average water balance for this area, uh, it's 585.55, right? Um, and then um, trying to think of, what, oh yeah, the statistics question earlier. So underneath here is also this um, link called statistics. So I can just click on that. And this will give me the stats for the whole map. Um, so that was that table that I had in the presentation earlier as well. So it might be a bit slow because I'm also running the simulation. Oh, there we go. Um, so it tells me all areas, the minimum, uh, water balance can also be negative, by the way, as you can see in legend as well, um, where we have more evapotranspiration than precipitation on a long-term average climate. Um, and that just means that those areas are very dry and reliant on water coming in from elsewhere or groundwater resources, etc. cetera. Because obviously this is pixel based. Um, but yeah, you can see all the stats for the, for the whole map, so minimum, maximum, um, the total mean for the whole grid, the area mean, because it's um, a raster-based model, areas are not necessarily exactly the same as the number of one kilometer pixels. So this will calculate a true planimetric area and gives you the mean of that. Um, and then there's some other things underneath here yet again. Um, analyze is a function, an option to pl make create plots. So what is the total water balance plotted um, against my tree cover map, for instance, and it gives you scatter, scatter plots. And you can do that for any input and output map in there. Um, and you can download these as Excel files as well. Um, and so these tools are very useful to look at some of the, you know, data inputs, um, some of the, the relations, correlations, uh, and are useful for um, some of the validation and the um, uncertainty analysis. Um, there's one thing called calculation, um, and that opens up, again, a whole suite of other options. Uh, map algebra, simple raster calculation. Um, Spatial functions, mean gradients, uh, I'm not sure that one does anything. Calculate bands. Um, so essentially what all these options do are very similar to what you can find in any GIS. So, you know, some of this will be more useful to people that um, you have used the GIS before. So, you know, convert to integer, convert to floats. These are all quite technical concepts, but could be really useful um, for specialists. And then there's some hydrological uh, functions here as well. Um, one of them I showed in the presentation, which was this um, uh, footprint. So the hydrological footprint is the downstream influence um, based on a water balance. Um, 
So yeah, there's there's a number of other options in water world, um, and some of these are available in Frosty Nature as well, that you can access once you've run the mock model. Um, so that's the the map based um, uh, things. So well, actually, the, yet again, there's more. I, I should show this one as well because this is the one I used again in the presentation. Is this threshold by function? So, you know, we were interested in the top 30% in costing nature. All I did there was to threshold by, show me above 70% uh, and it gives me the value. In this case, I can also say, say show me above 1,000 uh, millimeters and exclude nowhere a year. And it should show me only those top areas. Um, and there is, so it goes from 1,000 to the top 2,360. So there's lots of um, functions in here, again, that you would find in uh, a, a, any GIS. Um, right. Um, let's see time. Yeah, but maybe, maybe I can show you one more thing. So um, as I mentioned before, water worlds can also be used to look at these uh, nature-based solutions options. Uh, and the way it works is it calculates storages. So it calculates blue and green water storages, for instance. Um, and so these maps are also produced, uh, or can also be produced, I should say. Um, and there's a whole range of um, accumulated storages, total storages and it does these for different um, types of ecosystem or different um, um, stores I should say. So floodplain storage capacity, uh, canopy storage capacities, um, total blue storage, total green storage, um, etc. And then we also have the protected storages. And the useful, these maps are really useful to see um, what you could do if you think about, for instance, nature-based solutions to um, um, mitigate against floods is say you want to, look, to know how much do we currently have available in, in soil stores um, or in wetland stores, for instance, and then run a scenario where you would increase uh, the number of wetlands or the, 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 the change of use of agricultural land and then see how your storages increase and therefore how much the, the risk in downstream uh, flooding is is reduced um, and so it's it's a, a very useful tool i think to look at um, where are your current stores in terms of soil storage in terms of canopy storage in terms of uh, well overall your blue and your green water stores in the system um, I won't go into much detail on that. Um, I should show you some of the other outputs actually. Um, so uh, we always go to step five results maps, but you may have noticed there's two other ones. There's one called stats, um, which is time series, which is not very useful. It shouldn't be very useful when we don't run it monthly, although it might still give us these. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, it does. So, um, because obviously it's a monthly model, you can still look at these, um, these time series um, throughout the model year, as we call it, uh, and see uh, these outputs um, and you can also download them as Excel files. And then finally, we have this result narrative, um, which is, can sometimes be useful, which is very quickly gives you a little narrative of of, um, of this uh, this run. So if I click on show all, because basically it's a text, pre-written text where all the bits here need to be filled in. So the water balance for the area was on average 170 with a 25th percentile of minus 92 and 75th percentile 380, absolute minimum, maximum, etc. Um, actually, vapor transpiration ranges from um, hundreds to 1600 with a mean of 870. And so this can sometimes be, be useful if you are trying to do, or you're doing lots of runs 
and you just want to remember some of the key key stats from a particular run, you can just run this, copy paste this into a document, for instance. Um, so that's some of the other outputs that we have available here. Right. Um, so that's the baseline run for water world. I'm now going to um, move on to policy exercise because we haven't done that in, in uh, costing nature either. So step five is always the results. Step four, so you go step back if you want to do a scenario. So I'm running this thing called policy exercises. And then I get these options, right? Climate change, land use and cover change, land and water management. Change input maps, one we've talked about quite a lot already, um, extractives and population. So in this case, I want to show you uh, a land use change scenario. I'll click on that. And that gives me a, a bunch of options here as well. We can do a simple um, forest uh, to herbaceous or herbaceous to forest uh, simulation using, uh, let's click on that. So this is just deforesting and reforesting really. Um, one of the, most, the simplest scenario settings. So you just say uh, deforest is a negative, reforest a positive, and then each pixel by a certain percentage. Um, and then you can include, exclude areas. Um, or you can define your own rule. So deforest or reforest each pixel by an X percentage for a, an X percentage of land where um, any of these maps has a certain value. So this is again, the way to sort of target your scenarios. And then you can add other rules to it as well. So ignore, for instance, above a certain elevation uh, or below a certain elevation um, or any other mass map that you can find in here or that you can upload as a zone of interest. Um, and then obviously we can't just say we deforest. Um, we also need to do something with that land afterwards. And so define converted areas um, can be agriculture or grazing or cropping or all natural or all protected. Um, so in this case, um, I'd like to do a um, scenario where we, um, let's say, convert the Kilombero um, uh, catchment into uh, more agriculture. So um, let's do a create land cover type. So this allows me to set percentage values for each of the land cover type that we have in there. So tree, herb, bear. Um, so let's do agriculture. And as I said before, because of that way, you need to sort of interpret agriculture. You need to give it values. Um, so um, typically would be very low on tree cover, maybe 5%. This is for each pixel, right? very high on herb cover, because that's crop, and then uh, remaining could be bear cover. Um, and I'm gonna do that for basically all pixels, so it's quite a drastic scenario um, for the Kilombero cluster, which is that map that I uploaded previously. So ZOI equals one. So that's the value of that map. Um, and define converted areas as, let's say, the most common agriculture locally. So this is either pasture or cropland really. We can also do some other things with fraction of water exposed to contamination. Um, uh, so we can change, this is for the water quality calculations. Uh, we can change those values a bit. Um, and then there's a couple of other things which I just leave to default. And then check and submit. Um, this is also the page, by the way, where maybe you just saw that the um, land use change model runs from, the quick loop land use change model. I don't think we have time to go into that, but um, that's the one that projects forward any sort of recent deforestation. So this also tends to take uh, a bit of time. Um, let's see, I could also revert back to a run that I've already done on this one. I might do that. Um, yeah, let's see. So this, what this will do is it's same to sort of the previous uh, run, you know, develop the, the data, so step two, prepare data, but obviously now it needs to make changes to maps as well. Um, so actually I'm gonna close that. 
Um, and I'm going to go back to the run that I've done already, which was also called agriculture. I'll take that. See if I can show you. So I went through that whole process previously um, and developed those, those maps. What it's doing now, it's looking at all the maps that change under the scenario conditions and then comparing those. So this is the whole range of maps. So if you set that scenario exactly the way as I just did, um, all of these maps will be affected, right? So clearly uh, the, the land cover maps, these three, um, but it will also have a bearing on other land uses, right? So pastures, uh, croplands, protected areas even might change. I don't think they do, but these are all the ones that potentially change. And so if I look at the change in tree cover, because I focus this scenario only on the Kilimbero catchment, um, if we look at the, the change or the scenario map, so on the left is the baseline, on the right is the scenario, um, you only see those changes take place here, which is what we wanted. Um, if I scroll underneath, I get this uh, compare icon um, or change icon, I should say. And if I click on that, I get a change map. And this is the way any sort of scenario result is presented in this model as well, is that you get um, baseline, scenario, and change. And so there's no change anywhere else. Um, uh, there is just change in um, the Kilombero catchment. So let's see if we can focus on that by just masking it. This is even before running the model, this is just setting up the scenario um, of change in tree cover ground. And you'll notice clearly all these values are negative in the legend here because this is quite a drastic deforestation scenario that we've implemented here, right? I mean, we basically um, looked at any sort of pixel that has any tree cover in it um, and reduced it to uh, a minimum of 5%. Um, and so pretty much all the blue areas see the greatest change uh, and the red areas, this is you know, the way these colors work, are uh, the least change. So the largest changes are in those blue areas. So this is something, whenever you set up a scenario, I would always advise to go through these maps and see, you know, did that make any sense? You know, because you set those parameters you set up this scenario and then at the end you get a page that just says run scenario. You could do that, um, but then you have no idea whether the way you set up the scenario actually makes sense. So I would always advise to have a look at, okay, did it do what I expected it to do? Uh, and in this case it did, because I only focused on this particular area here and I wanted to see, I expected to see reduction in, um, tree cover and, and quite a massive increase in croplands, which is the case, right? Um, and you should also be able to see that possibly from pastures. Yes. So obviously the agriculture there is a bit of a mix of pastures and croplands and both increase. So that's the scenario setup part. Um, something I haven't shown because we didn't go through to completion in the scenario setup is that you don't have to just stop at doing a land use change scenario. You can actually combine it with uh, what happens if I have a land use change and climate change. And that's what we call a stacked scenario. So once you've set up your scenario run, and I can't show that because we stopped that process, but you get a new window where you have the option of stack other uh, scenario on top of it. And then you can select uh, climate change, for instance, and say, okay, um, I'm having this sort of agriculturization in this particular area, but on top of that, I also want to see what is the added impact of um, putting climate change on top of that. And so that's a compound scenario, as we call it. Um, so we can't do that in that case, but that would be clear from the setup in this particular window. So just to 
to clarify, the, reason, the way I got to this window is in the top bar, you can always see what run you're in. So my baseline is this Tanzania country run. My alternative or scenario run is called agriculture. And when I click on it, I can see what my parameter values are. Um, and then you can click on show baseline and scenario and you get to those maps that um, I just shown you. Right, so we've done baseline, we've set up the scenario and I have run that scenario. So let's have a look at the scenario results then to wrap up. Now I apparently Pencil that preparation as well. So I can't show you results of the change analysis, unfortunately. Um, but um, I have shown you what it would look like through this interface. So whenever you run the scenario, uh, it's a real shame I didn't prepare that beforehand. Whenever you run the scenario, your outputs will be like this. So you get the same output you get from your baseline. But instead of um, just getting um, one map, you get this. You get your baseline map, you get your change, your scenario map, and you get this change map underneath it, right? Um, but any, everything else will look exactly the same in terms of the outputs. So all your maps, the, the way you interact with them, um, will be exactly the same. So we can look at baseline, scenario situation, and then change situation. And then you can even look at, there's another thing where it's just done in percentage change. Um, and so for each output map, you will get all of those uh, change maps um, with the histograms of that data as well. And then obviously you can do exactly the same um, interaction. You can view it straight in uh, Google Earth. Um, so we can do this, we can query the values. Uh, we can look at the inputs. This, oh, that's not done, so I can't do that for this one. Um, and we can also do all the statistics, etc., on the maps. So all the other things that we had available that are shown in um, costing nature, uh, the view by functions, et cetera, you can do in this map. Uh, and then the one thing that I didn't show, let's see if I can just go back to the baseline results. Um, so we'll go back to minute simulations. And this one. Right, so, so here you have the hill slope net erosion, total net erosion, um, and then there's a couple of uh, erosion maps further down as well. So gross hill slope soil erosion, uh, annual total net soil erosion, um, etc. We have the gross uh, soil erosion and the net soil erosion um, and the deposition as well. Um, one map I haven't shown yet is the water quality map. So the, the way wa water will calculate water quality is it calculates it as an index of potential pollution. So this map shows the, uh, as we call it, the human footprint of water quality. So this is the potential pollution in each pixel coming from upstream sources. Um, so this includes agriculture, includes point-based sources like mines, etc. Um, and it will tell you, you know, on a scale between zero and 100%, what is the potential pollution of this pixel? And this also obviously will change under scenario conditions. Um, let's see if I can show what I wanted to show in the other map. These pixel based values, let's see if it gives me the inputs. This is, this is what I meant about how you can interrogate the map, right? So you click on a point, click on inputs, and then you see this icon appear. If you click on that, you can see all the underlying data to get to the value of that pixel. And then if I click on show all, you can see 
um, the various maps that are associated with this map or are inputs to this map. So, uh, as I said, agriculture, presence of mines, presence of oil and gas wells, roads, etc. Um, what is the um, value at that particular point? In this case, it has quite a high, what, 45% potential pollution, which seems to be mostly because it's actually um, a bare area, which means it is uh, possibly, well, not according to these maps. Um, oh, it is a road, actually. So there you go. Um, so that's the way to look at, to interpret the uh, water quality, but also to get the um, underlying inputs to the map. Then this final thing, you can also click on all, and that should give me value at that particular pixel for all the input maps. Um, and that should take a little bit longer. But again, that is a way of interrogating um, your uh, output maps. 